Blog Talk Radio. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this conversation about your Kundalini Awakening experience. This is Chrisom, and I would like to welcome my co-host, the... I won't say it this time. I'd like to welcome Amelia Santara from the the Kingdom of Cork in the country of Ireland. Hello, Amelia. Hello, Chrisom. Hello, everybody. Hi, everyone in the chat room and everybody listening on the archives. It's good to be here, Chrisom. Um, I'd like to begin, as always, by just letting people know where they can go to if they would like to make a donation to support the work that Chrisom does with Kundalini Awakening Systems. I have received a few inquiries about where to make a donation, and people have asked me about the link on the Yahoo group, and I would just like to say the address I'm going to give now is the best place you can go to if you wish to make a donation. And that would be to www.ascension-kundalini.blogspot.com. And the donate button that you see there is up on the right-hand side at the top of the page, and it's very easy to donate after that, um, either through PayPal or Visa or whatever way you choose. Um, please know that although I give out this information every week, sometimes it is because I am asked specifically about it. And also, people want to know where they can go to support Chrism and the work that he does, and that's why I give out the information. It is not that there is an obligation on anybody listening to donate, although all donations are, of course, gratefully received. And not everybody who wants to donate is in a position to donate. So please know that that is okay too, and that the teachings that are given by Chrism are given without any requirement or any obligation for anybody to pay for them. And that is one of the wonderful things about the teachings and about the, the, the wonderful Kundalini teachings that come from Chrism. They are accessible to everybody in the various ways that Chrism gives these teachings. The Kundalini um, radio show is just one of the ways. There are also other ways, such as all the Facebook groups and all the different um, venues that Chrism puts the, the Kundalini teachings on. And very soon there will be a book. And so that will be something else where, um, where you can also read about Kundalini and the Kundalini process. So again, I'll give it to you once more. It's www.ascension-kundalini.blogspot.com. Thank you very much. And that's me, John Prism, for now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Amelia. Thank you. And as Amelia said, there is no obligation to give a donation at all. Um, it's very important that people don't feel, and I'm getting that echo, Amelia, so I'm going to put you in the blue here. There is no obligation for anybody to feel like they must pay for any of this. Um, uh, when I was early in my process, I was homeless. For many years and there was no way I could pay for any kind of kundalini uh, teaching there were no books and so I remember feeling you know so kind of abandoned by uh, society because of the, the you know the extreme levels of kundalini awakening that was experienced that I was experiencing but also the extreme hardship that can come to a person that is having this. And, and sometimes that hardship uh, in, includes extreme poverty. And so, of course, I would not uh, suggest that anybody must pay because of my experiences in these areas. But also, I also understand that the lights must be turned on. The, the, the Wi-Fi has to be paid for. Uh, and, and so, of course, we, we are gratefully accept any of the donations uh, that you would, in your generosity, feel compelled to give. Uh, in this conversation, I would, first of all, like to recognize Rosemary Goliath and Eileen Laurel and the many people that came, like 
Elizabeth Dalton Gonzalez. It was such a pleasure to meet her in person and all the new people that we met at the the uh, Minnesota seminar that just happened this last weekend, just a few days ago. Um, I would like to thank the people at the Lake Harriet Spiritual Community, the Living Waters Cafe in Lake Minnetonka. I would like to thank Laura uh, from Metamorphosis. I would like to thank the Russian community who came to uh, to another uh, talk that was given at the Living Waters in Lake Minnetonka. I would like to thank uh, Mark, uh, Rosemary's roommate, who was very, very uh, uh, happy and, and uh, joyful and opening into these areas quite well. And I would like to thank all of the people that attended the seminar. There's too many for me to remember the names, but I just, you know, I do remember you. I do remember giving a Shakti Pot to each and every one of you. And so I would like to thank all of the people that were able to attend the seminar. And what a blessed seminar it was. Uh, very, very very good energy, very, very, be you know, wonderful people, beautiful people, people that were called by their own kundalini to come and attend. Uh, it, was, it was an amazing weekend, and it was an amazing week leading up to the weekend, giving all these different talks. And so, once again, thank you, everyone. It's a pleasure to meet you. It's a pleasure to interact with you, and I look forward to more opportunities of interaction in the Minnesota uh, Twin Cities area, as well as Rochester. Uh, so thank you, thank you, John and Mary and Dawn and Elizabeth Dalton Gonzalez and and everybody who came, uh, Trina, um, uh, Clifton, of course Eileen and Rosemary and Steve and many 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 of the people who came. Thank you, thank you very much. It was a wonderful experience, and I'd also like to thank the Best Western Hotel. Uh, Dakota Ridge in uh, the, the city that we were in, Egan, Egan, Minnesota, as they were very, very uh, beneficial and they're very, very supportive of what we were doing there in their conference room, which sometimes included lots of, of noise and <laughs> some very interesting practices that were, that were given for us to, to participate in. So once again, thank you everyone who attended the, se the seminar. This is the first seminar. Uh, that I have given in Egan, Minnesota, and uh, wow, what a what a wonderful event it was, and I look forward to more. So, without further ado, let's go ahead and jump in. Um, I, I think uh, Amelia has a few questions for me to contemplate, and I will contemplate them out loud with you. I'd also, before we jump into that, I would like to say hello to Julie. Hello, Julie, and B.A.V., I'd like to say hello to you and to Elizabeth Dalton Gonzalez, E.D.G., hello, good to see you, Fashti, Fashti, it's always good to see your name there, M.J. Henderson, hello, 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 and Suka, nice of you to join us on the uh, on the chat room, and if, if anybody wants to call in and, and would like to ask a question, about any aspect of their kundalini awakening experience, please feel free to do so. The number is 347-934-0026. Uh, I would like to thank my co-host, Amelia Santara, for her gracious uh, introduction and her, uh, you know, and her giving you the opportunity to make a donation. I also would also like to let you know that if you go to www.kundaliniawakeningsystems, the number one dot com, uh, you can receive a lot of information there. It is free. You can also go to kundaliniawakeningseminars.com. There's a lot of information there, and it is free. You can go to the YouTube network, the YouTube channels, and the channel is Chrisum Kundalini, and that will take you to about 300 uh, videos that have been posted specifically for Kundalini Awakening people to partake of. You can go to the network of Facebook, and you can, you can uh, participate in many communities there, some of which are Kundalini Awakening exclamation point, Kundalini Awakening Systems 2. You can go to the Facebook page of myself, which is Chris Mitchell or Chrisom, 
uh, Kundalini, and that will give you much information as well. So you do have opportunities on the Yahoo group. You can go to Kundalini Awakening System 1 at Yahoo Groups, and you can also go to Kundalini Healing at Yahoo Groups. So there are many, many, many opportunities. I also have a, a beginning group that's called Kundalini Virgins and for people that haven't experienced the Kundalini yet. And so as much as we have been able to do, we're doing our very best to give outreach to people who, who need information about the Kundalini Awakening experience. And uh, with that in mind, I would like to welcome my co-host back on the air, Amelia Santara. Unless she has gone to the bathroom somewhere. <laughs> there she is. <laughs> Maybe we could start saying, unless she has gone to make a cup of tea. <laughs> tea, tea, there we are. That's <laughs> Okay, okay. <laughs> People are going to think that I have an issue with my bladder. <laughs> Okay, so I suppose I was looking through the groups as I have done in the last um, couple of, of shows and I have some questions gathered, Chris. Um, there was a very recent post, actually, I'd say probably within the last hour or so, and I'm going to begin with that one, if I may. It Please. was a question from somebody about um, the breath of fire, about using the breath of fire as a practice daily. And rather than read out the whole question, because it's quite long, actually, you know, the lady is doing it as a Korean. She does these breath of fire exercises. She gets cramps in her uterus. She also has an issue with her uterus, her uterus but um, she has en- endometriosis. But it's endometriosis. But it's just really in relation to the breath of fire. Could you speak about that in relation to a Korean sure, sure. context? Sure. Now, the breath of fire is, it, once again, breath of fire is very similar to why yoga was invented. People want, people were observing uh, other people having kundalini awakening experiences. They were seeing them have bliss and ecstasy and at oneness with, with all divinity and with all creation. And, and, you know, this is a very, very, very beautiful, very, very amazing, loving, happy scenario. Uh, thank you, Elizabeth uh, Dolphin Gonzalez. Thank you. Um, this was a, an extremely blissful and sacred and wonderful event, especially, you know, back in the early Sanskrit days when the Sanskriti people and the Rishis uh, were exploring and implementing different levels of Kundalini upon them, writing books like the the Rig Veda and and really beginning to pass down. A, you know that you know that amazing oral history uh, that they passed down with regards to uh, spiritual um, experience in, in Kundalini in particular. So at the same time that people were observing uh, other people having the Kundalini and, and watching the different kriyas, which is the different automatic spontaneous body positions that the person would go into per the kundalini, you know, being controlled by the kundalini. Uh, They also looked at different levels of breathing. And one of the levels of breathing that the kundalini will bring upon the the person, this is the awakened kundalini, will bring this upon the person, is the breath of fire. And it's in a very rapid inhale and exhale uh, 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 breathing technique that the kundalini itself will bring upon a person. And this, like many of the yoga uh, moves and positions and body positions, uh, was incorrectly interpreted by many and has, and up to this day, you know, you know, six, seven thousand years later, you know, this is incorrectly interpreted as a way of awakening, and really, it is more a way of storming the gates of heaven. Because this is something that the kundalini gives a person to do. This isn't something that the ego of the person gives that individual to do. If the ego is behind, it's like, oh, let's just do breath of fire, dude. Yeah, oh, okay. You know, you're going to run into some real problems. And you don't want to do breath of fire. Now, I know a lot of yoga studios, a lot of yoga teachers, especially, you know, kundalini yoga people, you know, they're all about you know, basically doing uh, the yoga that is a a reflection of kundalini kriyas, 
but also this breath of fire technique that is another reflection of the sacred kundalini teaching the awakening person. Well, if you're not an awakening person, if you're not an activated uh, awakening person being controlled by the kundalini, you're going to have some real problems with this. It can it can begin to give you a level of chi sickness. It can begin to to give you a level of burning the the energetic anatomy by putting too much energy without very much uh, refinement into the system. So yeah, you'll have problems with your ovaries. You'll have problems with your testicles. You'll have problems with uh, endometriosis and, and many other associated diseases. You'll have these problems because you're pushing an envelope that you haven't refined yourself clearly enough to do. You'd be far better to practice the safety protocols. Far better to do this as that is written by the kundalini for those who are searching for the kundalini and for those who are having the kundalini. They go hand in hand. You know, when a, when a person pushes the envelope with kundalini, well, the pushback from the kundalini can be quite severe. Uh, kundalini is an extreme energy. It is a wonderful, conscious, self-aware energy. And it knows you, but it also knows that, that you know, Within, the, within your karma and within your level of refinement at that point, you're not going to hear its teachings in you. You won't hear it. You won't feel it because you're not there yet. You're not ready to have it yet. And yet there you are. You know, you're, you're being pushed by a yoga instructor or by a belief system that says, oh, you must do breath of fire at the end of a yoga system. And, you know, this is really, really damaging to people. I never ask people to do breath of fire outside of the kundalini awakening or activated uh, condition that they may have. And even in that condition, you know, it's got to be controlled by the kundalini. I was just reading this uh, book here, actually not reading it, but just kind of like looking through it a little bit, written by uh, Swami Satyananda Saraswati. You know, and, and, you know, they're going into... Once again, they're doing this. They're doing the breath of fire, and they're you know really trying to push it. They're trying to control the kundalini, and this is this is a very very unfortunate approach, and it's not necessary. But people want their ego wants to be in control. They want to know that they are doing this on purpose by themselves. They don't need no teacher. <laughs> They don't need any instruction. They just need to do what they want to do, as you know, as opposed to what the Kundalini would guide them to do. If you're hearing this broadcast, if you're hearing this information, I'm I'm going to to give you a clue, and the clue is practice the Kundalini Awakening Safety Protocols. Those are an awakening platform by themselves. And your kundalini, begin to understand that your kundalini is self-aware, it is conscious, and it will guide you. You will have guidance from your kundalini. It may not be written in a book. It may not be written on a, on a, on a web page. It may just come to you in your mind, in your brain, in your dreams, in your waking life, through, through levels of synchronicity, through levels of visions, through levels of intuition. These are the words and these are the pages that the kundalini will often use to communicate its instruction upon the person. Breath of fire or bastrika, which is another one people just love to use to blow out aspects of their energetic system. So, so please, please, people, really understand this. Do not rush into this. Take the time to do the research. Take the time to get to know what it is you're doing. Do not take uh, uh, instruction about Kundalini from people who don't have it, and most yoga instructors do not have it. Most of the Kundalini awakened, or, or, or I'm sorry, the Kundalini yoga people instructions, I don't care how many turbans they have on their head, they don't have the awakened Kundalini. Okay, they're all there to do the same thing that an unawakened person is trying to do, which is trying to awaken the kundalini within their system. Uh, with endometriosis, endometrio endometriosis is basically a, a condition of the energetic anatomy that has been pushed too far by certain techniques or certain uh, stresses from living. 
And, and, you know, there's very little that can be done about endometriosis except awakening the kundalini, which, of course, would begin a healing vector or a healing modality upon endometriosis. Your ovaries will be fried if you continue to practice breath of fire uh, uh, without any kind of a, of a, a kundalini-activated or awakening protocol being given to you. Your testicles will be fried. Your libido will disappear. Okay? Uh, you will have pain in the, in the reproductive organs. You will have pain in the whole reproductive system. And you may begin to have pain, as this woman is experiencing, uh, with, with levels of endometriosis or levels of phantom pain that no MD, no CAT scan, no, no uh, you know, medical imaging can find in you. You may begin to burn your kidneys. You may begin to burn your, your adrenal glands. I mean, this is not a pleasant experience. If you continue to, to storm the gates of heaven, you storm the gates of heaven, and, and those gates will push you back so hard that it will give you a real opportunity to, to think about what it is you're doing and why. And I'm going to invite you to think about what it is you're doing and why. What do you think storming the gates of heaven is going to get you? Better to be invited and escorted into the gates of heaven by the divine itself, by the kundalini awakening. These are the ways that, that people need to understand. And don't be so addicted to a quick way. And not, not saying that you are, but many, many people are trying to really, really push the envelope. They take drugs. They take, you know, uh, plant guidances or what they like to call uh, uh, plant allies, you know. Not everybody is Terrence McKenna. Terrence McKenna was a big pioneer towards using different uh, psychoactive uh, plants in order to to gain information that exists beyond the five senses. Not everybody is Terrence McKenna, and not everybody should be doing that. Uh, oh, sorry, I just hit my cord here. Hopefully I'm still being heard. Still being heard, anyone? Yeah, just I have to control my <laughs> my hands here. So yeah, you know, I, I counsel people not to do psilocybin. Not that psilocybin's wrong. There's, I'm not looking at it as an ethical issue. I'm looking at it as a way of, of pushing the energetic envelope too far, too fast, without enough information about what is what is going on within the individual system. Um, if you find yourself to be, a, a, you know, a person that has levels of anxiety or levels, you know, people are a little high strung, you know, these people may not be a good, uh, uh, you know, psilocybin may not be the way to go for you. Maybe doing some more meditation. Maybe learning how to still the mind. Maybe doing levels of breathing that are far more, that are far longer and stretched out rather than breath of fire or bistrika, which is almost the same thing. Don't push this. Let it push you. Okay? Do not do breath of fire outside of kundalini activation or awakening. I don't care what your yoga coach tells you. I don't care what your life coach tells you. Do not overstimulate the energetic anatomy because it will hurt. And it will not, it's not just a day or two. It'll hurt for months or years. You know, a, 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 a place. And if you push these systems too hard using bistrika or, or uh, too much yoga or too much prayer or too much breath of fire or, or entheogens such as, as uh, psilocybin, peyote, or any of the, you know, the hallucinogens that are used for spiritual purposes by many Aboriginal, Native American, and other Aboriginal um, peoples, you're, you, you're inviting a very, very difficult situation upon your endocrine system. And, you know, you can't get them at Walmart. The Chinese aren't making them yet. So once the, you know, if the Chinese start making endocrine systems, well then, of course, you know, you'd be able to push it and replace it that way. Okay, and I'd like to 
to uh, welcome uh, guest 2048. Thank you for joining us. And I see Fasti is typing. Hello, Fasti. Uh, Fasti says, yes, it is best to approach enlightenment in a balanced and detached state of consciousness. And scroll down a little more. Yeah, yeah. I, I couldn't agree more, Fasti. It's a very, very, very good approach. Okay. Uh, Ms. Santara, do you have another question? Or do you have a, do you have a question? I do. I actually... With... Sorry? I do you have any questions? Have... <laughs> do you have any question that is associated with the answer that I just gave? Oh my goodness me! Um, okay, you you had a quote. There was a quote on the group, um, and it began with this sentence: "There is no defense against the Kundalini." And. Um, you know, do what will I read the whole quote? I would really I think it would be wonderful to hear you speak more about that. Do you want Go me ahead to and read, read the whole read, quote? Read, read okay. the quote. Sure, sure. There is no defense against the Kundalini. It is inside of you and is part of you and knows you better than you know yourself. You do not defend against your arms or your legs, do you? You do not defend to defend against your eyelashes or your heart, do you? And even if you could, why would you? Same goes for the Kundalini. It will begin to unburden you of your fears, not by taking them away, but by giving you direct experience with them, the opportunity to release them. Remember, there are reasons why you fear what you fear. Other existence or karma or a difficult childhood, it's a long list. Kundalini gives you fears so that you may progress beyond these fears by coming face to face with them and balancing them. Okay. And your question is? Well, my question is, <laughs> could you speak? It seems so perfect. I don't know why, why you would say another word. <laughs> but I just think that is a wonderful quote because I think it's... Um, it says so much in such a few short words. It explains so much against why you do not actually defend Kundalini. You know, so I would just like yeah, to yeah. give a more about it. You, you don't want to see Kundalini as your enemy. And a lot of people that have the early awakening experience will see their, thank you, will see their Kundalini as an enemy. They'll see it as, because they don't know what it is. And it's beginning to take, control of their body it's giving them kriyas it's giving them visions it's giving them dream instruction it's showing them animals that are frightening to them such as tigers or you know spiders or serpents or you know any of the the the, the apex predators that come your way uh it can be quite frightening for people and we're used to being in control of our body or at least under the illusion of being in control of our body and when in fact you know, we are in control of very little of our body. The autonomic nervous system is not in your control. You don't get to control that, okay? You don't get to control how you digest your food or how you uh, how your nerves respond. I mean, and when you try, it's typically not good for the body because you, fully, you throw yourself out of balance with it. So as people who are having early kundalini symptoms begin to experience these symptoms, they're, they're frightened, they're frightened because all of a sudden the illusion of control is being severely upset. People, people are, are beginning to, to, to wonder, oh my God, am I going crazy? Oh my gosh, do I have some disease like uh, multiple sclerosis or, or you know, what's going on with me? My, I'm being pushed into these positions that I've never heard of, you know. They've never done yoga, and yet all of a sudden they're doing yoga in their sleep. They wake up in a yoga position in bed, or they'll be reading a book, and they'll be watching a giant spider the size of a plate just calmly spin its way right past their face. It can be terrifying. It can be terrifying. And, and yet you need to understand that the most important thing to do with regards to kundalini is to surrender to it. And yes, you will be given opportunities, as Amelia mentioned, to face the fears. Fears are some of the first things that come up for a kundalini person. Seriously, that's one of the first, very first things 
that a person will experience with regards to the Kundalini because the phenomena the phenomena can be overwhelming. And, you know, even at the beginning, just little tiny pieces of phenomena, little things like like hearing your name called in a room or, you know, uh, uh, flashes of light or little floating suns, you know, these... These are these are fairly innocuous uh, uh, phenomena, but for a person that's never had that kind of phenomena, it can be a very big deal. And so you don't want to see the kundalini as as your enemy. You don't want to see it as something that you need to feel the the urge to defend against. Quite, you know, on the contrary, you need to begin to to give yourself into this experience. And yet, you know, if you don't know what's happening, then of course, you know, people are going to panic. And people are going to run to the ER, they're going to run to an MD, and, you know, they'll be given SSRIs or Depakote or Wellbutrin or any of these really heavy tranquilizers to try to, to tap down the, uh, the phenomena because it's scaring them. And so what I'm going to ask and suggest is that you don't need to be afraid of the Kundalini. The, but really, the only thing at first that you need to be afraid of are your own fears. Kundalini is not the enemy. It's the cleansing agent. It's the detoxifier of your energetic and your and your all of the systems that run the body. It will clean the blood. It will clean the bones. It will clean the internal organs. All of which have very, very specific energetic input into the Kundalini awakening event that a person may be having. And so you can't defend against your heart you can't defend against your chin you know some people look in the mirror they don't like the way they look oh my gosh my chin my chin is just this way or that and they want to oh my gosh you know they have a lot of negative self uh, dialogue about their chin or the size of their breasts or the size of their muscles or whether their eyebrows do what they want to do. Now, of course, you can cut the eyebrows or trim them or do any of the, You know, eyebrows are a little different. <laughs> and so are the breasts, I guess, these days. You can get any size you want, you know. But typically, if you're not looking at, at having surgery performed upon your body or having a, a beautician uh, carve a different style of eyebrow, Typically, you don't really have the option. You just need to begin to accept yourself the way you are. Accept yourself the way you are. Don't try to, to change it in order to, to meet a certain societal expectation. And certainly don't begin to, to go to war with the Kundalini by going to an ER, going to an MD, unless, of course, you feel like you need to. I'm not a medical professional anymore, and therefore, I cannot give you medical advice, but I can certainly give you Kundalini advice. And uh, you'll be far better, you'll be far more healthy if you just allow the Kundalini to do its work and to recognize that it is indeed doing this work for your benefit, for the cleansing of fear from your system. The scenario with the Kundalini is that it, it's turning you into a, a very powerful divine flesh temple. And as you build that flesh temple, you don't use building materials uh, that, are, that are rotted or that are, that are in, our, in, you know, in this context, that are full of fear. You don't use cracked bricks to build a brick-and-mortar building, and neither do you use cracked or fearful bricks to, to build the Kundalini uh, Divine Temple that it is turning you into. No, you, you take out those, those, uh, that building material that has so much fear inside of it. You take that out. You begin to understand that, wow, you know, I'm not so bad just the way I am. Sure, I might be a little overweight. Sure, I may not be as strong as the as that guy over there lifting, you know, 600 pounds. Sure, I may not be Marilyn Monroe or some other, you know, icon of beauty. But that beauty is only skin deep, and it's time. You know, it's a it's a it's a time dependent scenario. You don't you don't stay 21 forever, and I don't. Ex 
you know, I would, I would suggest that you don't try to accept yourself as you are at the age that you are at this time in your life and allow the kundalini to use that self-acceptance as a way of beginning to build and to cleanse and to detoxify the body system away from ego-based assumptions of what should be or should not be. Kundalini knows you better than you know yourself. It knows your karma. It knows how you are behind the veil of forgetfulness. You don't know this so much. And yeah, yeah, I know. You can go and, and there are some folks who can talk you down in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, in psychotherapy or hypnosis and go, okay, what were you doing right after you died this last time? And, you know, there's, and, and some of this is, 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 is good. Some of this is true. If, you're, if, you, if, you, uh, were, if you were drowned or, you know, you know, in some way in a previous life you were drowned and now you can't get in the water. Well, this can do a lot to help you uh, form a new friendship with, with water, uh, you know, basically to get rid of that fear. But it's the same kind of detox. It's just getting rid of fear. And the kundalini will come to you in certain ways that will allow you to experience fear. You can You know, you can be eaten by a giant snake or you can be attacked by a wolf or a dog or a you know, some other top of the eight, top apex predator, you know, and, and the best thing you can do is just turn to that predator and say, I am yours, go ahead, have me, I am yours. And all of a sudden you'll realize that you're in bliss and you're in ecstasy and, and the Kundalini is basically communicating to you that you have indeed passed this chest, my child. You are doing very, very well. And this is indeed what you are doing as you begin to face those fears and you begin to, to listen to what the Kundalini is suggesting that, that you do in order to bring about a stronger, a, 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 uh, a, a more uh, vivacious divine temple building material. <laughs> you're, you're, a, you're a building that is self-conscious and aware. It would be like the Empire State Building in New York being self-aware. Well, there you are. You are that divine temple made of flesh and blood and bone. You are that temple. You are that, that uh, walking, talking, holy grail. You are holding the divine within you, and it is, it, it is expressing itself through you and to everyone around you. So please don't see the kundalini as your enemy. Don't see it as something that you need to defend against. See it as something that you need to learn from and, and, and grow from and, and bring levels of grace into your body, into your system that are, are not you know, very compatible with an ego-obsessed society. In the ego-obsessed society, it's going to be very, very, very counterproductive to to facing fears. It's going to be all about responding to fear, responding to, to uh, a nightmare in, in a frightful way, encouraging fears to come up and responding to those fears, you know, because, you know, soon enough you become, you know, rather paranoid about life. Rather paranoid about who's saying this about you and, and, and you know, the fear of loss and the, and the want of gain become living, uh, living uh, uh, ideologies that the ego will want to live by. And the kundalini is just going the directly opposite direction. It's telling your ego to just begin to, to grow, to evolve away from some of these, these systems. And so the ego at first will, of course, try to maintain its control and authority over the individual, and, and it cannot. I mean, there's really nothing in the physical uh, multiverse that can, that can compete with a divine expression. You don't look to God and say, God, you know, I see you as my enemy now because you're not doing things that i like you to do. You're forcing me to clean up my life. You're forcing me to clean up my fears. Therefore, I'm going to go to battle with you. Who do you think is going to win? Ultimately, who do you think will win that altercation? It's not going to be you. It will be the divine. And so, yeah, you, 
the Kundalini is not out to get you. It's out to transform you. And some of those areas of transformation include the, the facing of fear and the, the release of attachment and the, you know, the release of, of having the ego control you. So, so Santara, that is my response to that. Thank you very much, Chris. Thank you. Um, leading on from that, maybe, um, there was a discussion about phenomena in one of the groups. Um, yeah, about, you know, how... Okay, could you speak a little bit about, you know, say, phenomena versus no phenomena? Well, Would if you be, just speak... Is that enough? Sure, sure. That's fine. That's fine. Thank you. Thank you, Santara. Okay. So a lot of people are going for the phenomenon. They are really pushing, pushing, pushing. A lot of these practices that I spoke of with Bastrika and, and uh, Breath of Fire, you know, they're going for that phenomena. They want to have that phenomena at all costs, even at the cost of the health of the body. Well, they just want that phenomena. They want to be able to have that edge over the other person. They want to be able to be seen as a great and powerful mystic, psychic, uh, healer, whatever the case may be, you know, whatever, however, a person like is, is pushing themselves this way or that. Um, with phenomena, you know, the phenomena part of the Kundalini experience is is what throws people off. You know, if the Kundalini has come to you and you're activated and awakened within it, and you're you know you're getting all these different phenomena. Well, you need to understand that the phenomena is what can throw a person off of their game, off of their understandings of life, off of, i got to fix this thing here just a second here, I don't want to lose it, off of their, uh, their, uh, you know, listening to the, the Kundalini, you know, the, the desire for phenomena and the expression of phenomena, you know, is what can really put a person into the psych ward. You start hearing voices, boy, they got a drug for that. You start having Kriyas, well, they got an anti-spasmodic drug for that. You know, so there, there, there are many levels of phenomena that, that can be disturbing to a person's experience as they go through their life, get the kids ready for school, go to their job, you know, you know speak with their family and friends, and, and generally live the life that they've been living up to the point that the Kundalini began to make itself known. And... You know, it's, it's, it's a very life-changing event, this phenomena. And so people are going to need to talk about it. Now, as you come in uh, to the Kundalini, depending on how that occurred for you, if you did it through various levels of, of uh, and I have to, you know, say, lost your mind, my attention. Now, you don't get to knock the glass over. I know, I know. Okay, there you go. That's my cat. She likes to listen to these conversations, believe it or not. So as you come into the Kundalini, depending on how that occurred, were you doing drugs? Were you, you know, were, were, you know a lot of people that have drug experiences or alcoholism or heroin or, you know, many of the different experiences that a person can have that might, might initiate a, uh, a, a dreadful stressing of the body that can really, really begin to to ultimately kill the person. Well, the Kundalini may step in and allow uh, for its presence in the person to, to overtake that person. And a person may have eradicated some of the, or, or damaged some of the areas of the energetic uh, body uh, during those, those uh, addictions or during those types of scenarios that the human being can have. And Listen, you're going to have to make that jump over there. Yes, yes. Okay. So, no, you can't put your tail on the computer. Here, I'm going to put you over here. There you go. Okay. All right. So, as that occurs, as, as the person's energetic anatomy is being challenged and damaged by the drug use or the alcohol use or whatever it is, the Kundalini may step in and begin to... To, to redact or to heal those areas or at least to begin to open the person to other options. They may have occluded or, or damaged some of the expressive areas that a person can experience through the Kundalini awakening or 
the person's karmic design may not allow for them to have severe phenomena happen to them, you know. And it's not to be judged. You know, people need to talk about their phenomena. This is the stuff that's going to put them in the psych ward, and I encourage them to talk about it. Now, I know that some other people are possessed by entities that they allow to come in, and, the, you know, the entities will basically, you know, try to build up the person. And uh, you see the input in it, you can see that, you know, this is basically an entity that is using its unrefined ego to express through a living person and to stimulate their unrefined ego. And so, of course, you're going to get a lot of, you know, I can move buildings, you know, I can, you know, you know, do this, this or that. You know, these are these are some of the things that we just have to deal with along the way, because even as that entity is possessing that person, it will have a, a parasitic evolution right along with the Kundalini awakened person. But as far as people having phenomena versus no phenomena, no phenomena, you know, is still a, 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 a truthful vector of the Kundalini. Many people, you know, whether they've done drugs or not, if they even haven't even done, done drugs, they don't have a strong level of phenomena occurring. It doesn't mean they don't have Kundalini, but it does mean that, that you know, maybe, maybe they're just more acclimated to the to the uh, kundalini that's coming through maybe it's something that that uh that they do not need to have a lot of phenomena you know it's not about pink bunnies and, and and you know and cotton candy floating across somebody in their dreams and that's not fair to the to the people that are having the kundalini phenomena you know they have to express this this is how they maintain balance within the society that they're in and so I encourage people to talk about their phenomena. It's not the whole ball of wax. Absolutely not. And you get to a point where where phenomena isn't something that you really want to talk about that much. It's not, you know, you've gone through it, you're listening to it, you're, you're going with it, and you're learning from it. You know, it, phenomena is just basically the toolkit that a person, you know, into coming into the Kundalini can experience, like telepathy or psychokinetics or psychometry or levitation or any of these types of things. You know, that is what it is. It is important to discuss it and to get it balanced within a person. And when we're in a community, like, you know, we're on in Yahoo or the Facebook communities, people come into these communities with different levels of of understanding with different levels of experience, you know, and I'm certainly not, uh, you know, going to say don't talk about the phenomena. I'm going to encourage just the opposite. You go ahead and talk about your phenomena. You know, don't let it be all about your phenomena, though. Don't let it be all about your phenomena. You're going to hear Lasha's bell here, so I, I just want you to know that she's, she does like to participate in these, uh, in these conversations. But I just can't let her walk all over the computer like she wants to do. So I just wanted to say that, you know, it's just because you're not having phenomena doesn't mean that that uh, that you need to look down on those that are. Doesn't mean that you need to make negative commentary about those that are. Just practice the safeties. Be tolerant. Be patient. Be forgiving. And if, if you know, if if reading about phenomena is is a bother to you, then don't read about it. Don't read about it if it bothers you. Okay? Next question, my dear. Hello, Amelia? Are you there? Oh, yes, I'm back. That took a fly long. I was making tea. (laughs) <laughs> okay, the next question, um, let me see, oh, where did I put it? Um, yeah, the next, I just made a few notes, um, Prism. This this question comes up regularly on our groups, as, you know, quite regularly. And the question is how, oh, there's a lot of noise. How, do you, awake, how do you awaken the Kundalini? Now, that's not so much what I want to ask you. It's more... 
comments and discussion that arose recently about that, you know, that um, there's an idea or a philosophy there or a thinking that, you know, we're on this effortless journey and that there's no need for us to look or to seek anything, including a Kundalini awakening, you know, that, that everything happens by itself. It's effortless. And oh, yes, yes, um, yes. W- would you speak on that? Well, effortless. Let's talk about effortless. Uh, Kundalini is not effortless, and and neither is Lasha when she uh, when she pushes my little things down there on the floor. And she's she's doing well. I just want to know she was sick for a little while, and I'd like to thank everybody that sent her healing. She's doing very well now. She's playing. Um, effort within the Kundalini requires effort. Effort is required in life. You have to to put food in your mouth. You have to actually pick it up, either with your mouth or with your your hands or whatever implement that you're using to, you know, put the food in your mouth. This requires effort. All life requires effort. You know, a, a, a paramecium, a, a, a one-cell biological uh, creation must search out and find food. Life requires effort. So for people to say, oh, just sit back and do nothing and kundalini will be effortless and will come to you effortless, effortlessly. You know, I'm just not buying it. I'm, and I don't think it's very, it's not true. Everything of a, of a, of a, of a nature of life requires effort to some degree. It requires effort. Kundalini does require effort. Typically with Kundalini, you have to come half the way. And you may not have, you may have done that in another life. You may have set the stage for a full-blown awakening seemingly without effort in this lifetime. But it took effort to develop yourself, to refine yourself to the point that you're able to have a seemingly effortless kundalini awakening experience. And then, once the kundalini comes up, well, then it's all about effort. Putting that tongue up, putting your fingers in the Gaya Mudra, you know, uh, eyes up, meditating, praying, doing, you know, eating veg- vegetables instead of meat or eating meat instead of vegetables. These require effort. There is nothing that is effortless about kundalini. Even the surrender to kundalini requires effort. It requires effort to control the ego. It requires all different levels of effort. And yeah, some of the effort is easier than others, but it is effort nonetheless. So so for people to say, oh, just relax, and if it wants to come, then it will come, and if it doesn't want to come, then it won't come, well, to some degree that is true. That is true, but even sitting down and relaxing requires effort. Even taking the mindset of just, okay, I'll just leave it alone, let it do whatever it wants, that in itself has required effort. Now, to to awaken the kundalini, there are many ways to awaken the kundalini. You know, and as many of the, the ancient masters wrote, awakening the kundalini is easy. Living with the kundalini is very, very, very difficult sometimes. Once again, you know that takes me right back to the to the uh, to the safety protocols. Safety protocols are a guideline of how to live with the Kundalini, how to live within love, how to live within patience and tolerance and gentleness and compassion. You know all these noble qualities with which represent the grace of the Kundalini. You know that requires effort as well. It, you know, you have to lift a finger, and I don't mean a middle finger. <laughs> you can do, you can save that for somebody else or some something else. But with the Kundalini, you must take steps as you walk with it, and as it walks with you. As I've said before in these programs, Kundalini isn't so much a path that you walk; it's a path that walks you. But you also walk it. it it's a it's it's a 50-50 uh, scenario. The Kundalini will, you know, give you an intuitive instruction. Oh, you better turn left here. Or you're going to get hit by a truck. Well, so you pay attention. 
You pay attention to what the Kundalini is telling you to do. And you make the effort to pay attention. You don't make assumptions that, oh, the Kundalini, oh, the Kundalini, I don't have to do anything. Okay. And I'm not buying this whole idea, and, and, and I think this ties into it, about illusion. You know, a lot of people say, oh, well, it's, it's an illusion. Everything is an illusion. And so, therefore, since everything is an illusion, we don't have to make any effort at all. This is really not a correct teaching about illusion or maya. Uh, yeah, yeah, everything's maya. Everything is an illusion. But it's an illusion that has purpose, or we wouldn't be here within it. The, the purpose of illusion is to uncover the illusion, is to see the truth behind our manifested, our, our manifested ideas or ideologies or fantasies. It's about overcoming the, the, the idea that we have to attach our ego to everything. We have to collect all this money. Go to China. You know, if you ever go to China, and I have a few students that are in China, you know, it's all about money at the expense of everything, at the expense of the environment, at the expense of family, at the expense of friends, at the expense of the general population. It is all about collecting money at this time in, in most of the major cities of China. And I was just sitting next to a guy on his way to China uh, on the airplane yesterday as I, as I flew back from Minnesota, you know, and he basically... He basically, you know, validated what my students were telling me. Okay? So, illusion, illusion is our ego. Illusion or illusion is, is what our ego, uh, you know, attaches to. Ego will attach to fear. Ego will attach to pleasure. Ego will attach to, to many of the different societal expectations that, that ego likes to attach to, and this is the illusion. Kundalini is not an illusion. Kundalini is the key that opens the door into, the, into a reality that is of truth, okay? that is of transformation, that allows you to transform yourself from a, from a human being that is locked in a five-sense system, a, a sensorial system of five, into an unlimited sensorial system that allows you to see behind the veil, that allows you to see within your own fears and your own weaknesses and your, your own ego's attempts to dominate uh, yourself and, and your choices and, and your, you know, your attachments. Kundalini is, are the, you know, Kundalini are the special glasses that you wear to see beyond uh, that five sense system, which is so uh, in, in many ways, corrupted by the ego senses, by the ego attachments, by the ego fears. You know, it's not, you know, everything is illusion doesn't really help anybody. You know, it's part of that, uh, that uh, system of, of oneness that, oh, everything is one, everything is an illusion, therefore, therefore what? What's your next step when everything is illusion? Oh, great. Okay, what's next? If it's all illusion, if it's all a lie, what's next? Is there truth? Is truth an illusion too? You know, so so I would just kind of gently and politely walk away from people that are just saying, oh, it's all an illusion. You don't have to worry about anything. Well, worry is also an illusion. So, And having to do anything is also an illusion. If everything's illusion, you know, then nothing isn't. Everything's the lie. And I'm going to say, no, no, no. The ego is the illusion. The ego's uh, propensity towards control over the environment, control over the emotions, control over the mind, that is the illusion. You know, people tend to take things too far, and, and in many cases they try to take things too far just to make it easier for them. Well, it's not always designed to be easy for the ego. Okay, this whole oneness system, you know, where people are going to this couple that are, if you look at them, they're, I, they're somewhere in India, you know, this oneness thing. You know, and you look at them and the guy's got a wide staring, uh, you know, he looks kind of like a zombie. And so does, the, you know, they're, they're doing their best to try to look like a statue so people can worship them. And, 
you know, it's just so amazingly silly to me. To me, that's just to me. You know, you can, uh, you know, you have the freedom to 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 really get into that if you wish. It's your choice. But for me, this is this this does not. This is not truth. Nobody just waves a hand, you know, or you know, even when I give sight, you know, Shakti Pot, you know, every quarter and at these seminars, you know, it's the Kundalini that's doing the work, the corporeal uh, uh, extension is just that. It's a corporeal extension. It's it's a bucket that holds the water, but it's the water that slakes the thirst. Okay. So, enough about that. Yes, Your Holiness. Do you have another question? Yes, well, it was um, about what you thought of living life in the body being an illusion, but you answered that one. So, yeah, thank you. Um it's referring back again to the, the question about awakening the Kundalini with a reference to the chakras, Chrism. Um, ah. You wrote about um, the chakras can become energized and you know how some people term that as an awakening and um, it's not the same thing energizing. Could you, the chakras? So what sure, does it sure. mean to activate a chakra? <laughs> Activating a chakra. Well, <laughs> yeah. um, a, a, just a second here. Let me get a real good download on that. Chakras are part of the energetic anatomy of a person. Uh, there are typically seven of them. Uh, certain societies only recognize five. Other societies recognize seven. The Asians typically recognize five from the base of the spine to the throat. Uh, other communities, shamanic and otherwise, recognize seven going from the base of the spine to the top of the head, the middle of the brow, and of course the, the other five that the Asians recognize. Chakras are part of an energetic anatomy, but they are also part of an autonomic functioning energetic anatomy, i.e., you know, a little kid doesn't realize that he has chakras or she has chakras. The little kid goes about their life doing just fine because the chakras are automatically functioning. This doesn't you know, this doesn't stop because you hit puberty or you become, you know, old enough to drink a beer. You know, this doesn't sh stop. The chakras know what they need to do and they do what they need to do. They know how to balance. They know how to, how to, uh, you know, detoxify, all of these things. Uh, you don't need to go to someone and go, oh, my gosh, oh, you have a severe chakra imbalance. Oh, my gosh, we'll have to work on that. Uh, you can see the chakras. Chakras aren't hard to see, but they they know what they need to do, and the Kundalini knows how to direct you within the idea of of activating a chakra. Basically, uh, there's forms of pranayama that a person can do, which is breathing into a chakra, chakra breathing, uh, that is very effective for Kundalini awakening purposes. Uh, but as far as you know. Uh, activating each and every chakra, well, that, that is not within the human purview. That is within the kundalini purview. When the kundalini initiates spinal sweeps or initiates certain levels of detoxification um, along the five-body system, five bodies being the, the mental body, the physical body, the emotional body, the psychological body, and the spiritual body, or the five purushas of the, uh, the Vedic systems, uh, you know, the kundalini knows what it needs to do with these chakras. It knows how to direct you, and it knows how to allow you. Many of the, of the safeties are, are directed into the chakra system, such as the pranayama that, that is described in the safety protocols. The pranayama is a way of, of working with the chakras and, and working with the, with the major and minor chakras uh, so, for instance, a major chakra would be, say, a heart chakra. A minor chakra would be the end points of the Ida and the Pingala as they terminate in the upper lip of each nostril. Okay? Uh, as you do pranayama, you're activating or you're, you're energizing those chakras. And the kundalini will, will give you that, will give you that, that information either through a, a kundalini awakened teacher or through those who have taken advice from a Kundalini Awakened teacher and continue that, that practice. 
Um, it doesn't guarantee an awakening. It just basically hyper-energizes that energy center. Uh, when I was doing, I, I did something for a couple of people uh, uh, day before, night before last in the, in the Russian community. And, and I just blew a little energy on the heart and on the ajna, just just because that's what I was guided to do with those two people. And so the Kundalini will guide you in, in what you need to do or what it wants you to do with the chakra system. Um, even if you're not activated or awakened yet, if you follow the safety protocols and you're doing the Gaia Mudra, you're doing tongue up, you're doing eyes up, you're practicing the noble qualities, well, these are refinement techniques to allow you to work with the chakra system. You have to remember that the five chakra system corresponds with the, the five bodies of human expression, which I just described. And so, and Qigong people knew, know this, the people that are practicing Qigong, uh, you know, and, and many of the Qigong practitioners will have mudras that will go. So, Gayan Mudra uh, is... is uh, is for the first chakra, or the red chakra, and that's the thumb tip and, and forefinger tip held together with the other three not touching. And then, of course, you, you go from the, the uh, index finger to the, to the middle finger, the one that gives you that, that uh, IQ expression when you're angry at somebody else. Uh, and so it's thumb tip to that fingertip, and then the next one is, you know, the third chakra would be thumb tip to the ring fingertip. And then, of course, the the uh, fourth chakra is the thumb tip to the little finger fingertip. And then when you put all five uh, fingertips to the thumb tip, well, that represents the fifth chakra. And so, and so on and so forth. And so these, these mudras, these finger positions are also recognized by, by the kundalini. And, and you can do that, although if you're just trying to awaken kundalini through the chakra system, then you just stick with the, the Gaia Mudra because that is the seat of the Kundalini. That is where Kundalini uh, is, is dormant in everyone who isn't awakened. Now, as far as activating the chakras, Kundalini activates the chakras during the activation process, which means it's the process where, it, where the first chakra is beginning to guide you to do certain practices, guiding you to be forgiving, guiding you to be tolerant, guiding you to be kind and compassionate and sympathetic and, and helpful and of service orientation and of, of uh, you know, not promoting a fear response, guiding you to do these things. And so in the activation process, the first chakra has been activated greater than all the other chakras. And you don't need to, to, to really do anything than what the Kundalini tells you to do. Now, if the Kundalini is, is saying, hey, yeah, you know, practice those kundalini safeties, well, then, then you begin to work with the other chakras through the instruction of the first or of the kundalini or of the sacred feminine. That is when you begin to practice chakra breathing uh, or taking a shakti pot, you know, like the quarterly shakti pot that we give or the, the in-person shakti pot that we give at the seminars. That is when you begin to practice those protocols of chakra breathing uh, into each chakra. And you can, you know, it, it can be quite effective, but you have to go through the other areas. You have to go through the other expressions of the noble qualities. It's not just so simple as, you know, pinching your chest and then breathing through that tactility point. You know, what kind of forgivenesses have you been doing? What kind of tolerances have you been experiencing? What kind of love have you been experiencing giving? These are just as important as any kind of physical, tactile effort that you're putting into the chakra system. But once again, in a, pre, in, in a pre-activated state, the chakras know exactly what they need to do. You don't need to go to somebody else to balance your chakras. You need to start taking the, you need, you need to stop doing what you're doing that causes the, the chakra system to go out of balance. You know, are you drinking alcohol? Are you drinking copious amounts of caffeine? Are you, are you into nicotine or pot or, I mean, marijuana or, or heroin or, you know, methamphetamine or, <clears throat> or cocaine or whatever it may be? What are you doing? 
to throw that heart chakra out of balance? Are you holding a grudge? Are you going for revenge? Are you driving your car as a weapon? Cutting people off here, cutting people off there because the only thing that matters is you? Is that what you're doing? Well, then stop. Stop doing that. Stop holding that grudge. Stop thinking of yourself only and bring a level of compassion and love into the expression of the fourth chakra. And that fourth chakra will balance right out. Do you not like to communicate with people? Do you like to hold the information to yourself? And, and even though you, you know, you, people need to hear your communication on the phone or through the computer or through letters or through the voice, are you just kind of withholding that communication because you just don't want to communicate? It's not something you're really confident about or you don't like to do it or, you know, you don't like to hear your voice. You don't like, you don't have a good vocabulary, so you don't feel that you could you can communicate effectively. Well, don't you think that might throw the communication chakra, your fifth chakra, out of balance? And it's not all about vocal communication. It's about communication between the chakras themselves. You know, where are you communicating uh, each of the five chakras balance systems? How are you communicating your security for the first chakra? And I'm just using one, one thing for each chakra because I don't want to go through all of them. How are you voicing your security for the first chakra? How are you voicing your creativity for the second chakra? How are you voicing your, your, your inner strength and your positive inner dialogue with the third chakra? How are you voicing your love in the fourth chakra? And how are you communicating all of those qualities through your fifth? You see what I'm saying? Now, the Ajna and the, and the crown chakra, the, you know, to some degree, that's an automatic scenario. You can get really, really, really lost in your life if you just focus on the sixth chakra and the, and the crown. And a lot of these systems do. They, you know, these, these, these new age systems that are promising enlightenment and promising, you know, to connect yourself with the divinity. Well, you'll connect yourself with some sort of divinity, but it won't be the kind that you're looking for. And it's not going to be the kind that is, that is helping you to, into an ascension platform. You just go into a whole new level of fear and instability and distrust uh, based upon opening an area that was opened way too soon and way out of balance with the rest of your energetic anatomy. If you're not practicing the safeties, if you're not listening to your kundalini, then leave your chakras alone. They know what to do. They know how to balance themselves. You don't need to go to somebody and go, oh, look at my third chakra, you know. And let's not forget, entities will attach to certain chakras too. You know, entity uh, incursion is, is also uh, a major player that you need to look at, you need to deal with. Do I own this emotion? Do I own this grudge? All of a sudden, I'm smoking cigars when I've never liked them before. Do I own that addiction? You know, there's... It, it, you know, it can be a little complex at times. So let the chakras alone. Practice the noble qualities. And if you're looking for kundalini, practice the safety protocols for kundalini awakening. And that's what I have to say about that, Ms. Santara. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, well, could you say a little bit about this, please? You know, Sometimes um, when a Kundalini person is trying to express the feelings that are coming up for them, they can come across as being crazy. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. That's, that's, a, that's a very real thing. and It goes back to the whole phenomena, phenomena question. <clears throat> a person who experiences Kundalini... Uh, will often begin to have phenomena that does not correspond with the, shall we say, standard phenomena that unawakened people will have. Unawakened people will not typically have entities shouting in their ear, you know, an instruction. 
Uh, they will not typically be able to see visions of dead people or visions of of exalted, uh, you know, people like Jesus Christ or Gautama Buddha or any of those people. You won't typically have that without the Kundalini being present within the system. It's not always the case. People can have mystical experiences or they can take drugs and they can begin to see, you know, those types of, uh, of interactions. But uh, the last thing you want to do is say anything about this to anyone unless you want to be taken to a psych ward. Okay. To a large degree, you just need to to stick to the program of self-expression that a person has. Oh, you need to stick to the level of self-expression that a, that a person has with with regards to the five cents individual Societal, society, ex, uh, you know, expected uh, interaction. So even though you might be seeing your dead grandma standing next to you, you just want to say to your family, so, well, gosh, I hope grandma's fine. And you'll just say, well, I think she's fine. You know, I have faith that she's fine. You know, you don't need to say, oh, well, she's standing right next to me. I can see her fine. Oh, oh and she says, you know, you you might want to back off of the alcohol, Uncle Bill, or you know, she you know, put the cigarettes out, Aunt Eddie. You know, so so you don't need to bring attention through your phenomena. And if you do, then yeah, you're gonna you're going to invite certain levels of uh, of fear into people. When you start talking about these things, uh, people can be frightened for you. As I, as I was saying at the phenom- or at the uh, seminar, you know, a person will have kundalini and they'll have the spinal sweep and they'll have that union with God and it'll be so so ecstatic and blissful and beautiful and loving and and the people will look at them and they'll just go, oh that Christian, he's just way too happy. Oh my gosh, look at him, he is so happy. I've never seen him so happy. This I don't know, this doesn't look right to me. And the other people will look at Chris and go, oh, my God, yeah, he's looking. I've never seen him this happy. This can't be right. This can't be right. This is just, no, this can't be right. This, We better do an intervention. <laughs> people do this. People do this. I mean, there's a person living in this town who runs a uh, rock shop. And, you know, she had this exact scenario happen. Her friends and family got together because she'd been in bliss for two weeks because of her kundalini awakening. So her friends and family got together and surprised her with an ambulance and a straitjacket and a month's stay in a psych ward with drugs. So there you have it. You know, you want to be very, very careful what you say to people. Now, I understand that the phenomena is going to make you feel as if you're crazy. And that that's fine. Um, I'm reading what Soul Connection has written. He says, there certainly is an external universe, but you are only seeing, feeling, smelling, imagining, remembering it, and interacting with it inside yourself. Well, I'm going to say to you, Soul Connection, that so above, so below, uh, you know, your interpretation of what is or is not happening does not necessarily mean that all people are going to see it the way you're seeing it. Um, you know, he says, or she says, whoever says, all meditators know that through direct, firsthand, continual, average, ordinary experiences, and they, oh, okay, they just kind of stop there. Uh, and to say all meditators is, is fairly uh uh, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It. It's absolutist in a way that says all this or all that. I mean, you can say typically this or sometimes that, but to say all this or all that is 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 fairly inaccurate, and it shows kind of a, a pushing towards certain types of belief systems. Um, anyway, so so. You need to understand that as people 
as people begin to experience these amazing phenomena, be okay with it. You're not crazy. You have the Kundalini. Uh, read up about the Kundalini. You can go to any of the sites that are mentioned here, that have been mentioned here. Don't necessarily feel free to tell your family or friends about it. Don't do that. That is one of the surest ways to get locked up in a psych ward. And, and I know I, I have another student, you know, and he, uh, he has this amazing smile. It's the Krishna smile. It's a smile that, that is extremely energetic. And when people see it, they become transfixed, you know, and, uh, and he's working, you know, in, in, a, in a very, very uh, involved field, you know, in the in the IT area with a very very po you know powerful company in the IT field, you know, and and I just say, I say, and I'm going to call him Frank. I say, Frank, 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 you just you just need to begin to smile that way. Smile, smile during the the uh, during your work. You know, smile when you're working on the computer. Let the kundalini come through you. And if anybody asks about your smile, just say, you just feel really good today. I'm having a good day. You know, you don't say, oh, yeah, I have the Krishna smile, and it's very powerful, and it can actually awaken your kundalini. You don't say that. You have to protect your freedom. You have to protect uh, the people who are around you. They won't understand because they don't have the reference points to understand. Without reference points, there is no understanding really typically. Because even when Kundalini gives you uh, intuitive instruction, well, that intuitive instruction is a reference point. So be very careful about how you judge yourself when you're having Kundalini phenomena. You're not crazy. When you're hearing the entities and the entities, you know, are going to make you, some of them are going to try to make you feel like you're crazy. Seriously, they will. I mean, I've had students where, you know, thousands of entities are screaming at them at once and, and other entities are saying, kill this guy or kill that girl or, you know, rob that store. You know, they try to make you feel absolutely crazy. And some of this is karmic, you know, it's karmically induced. But also it's, it's, a, it's a level of trust in your kundalini. You trust in your kundalini regardless of the phenomena that you're experiencing. And if you have a kundalini teacher, will you talk to your kundalini teacher? And if, they're, if they have the kundalini and they know what they're talking about, they will tell you that, hey, don't worry about this. Don't be afraid. You're not crazy. You're actually coming into self-realization and enlightenment. Don't worry and don't listen to the entities. Just ignore them. Ignore them. And sometimes, yes, it is difficult to ignore them because they're so loud. They're inside your head. It's like a, a telepathic uh, communication. And, and so it can be very, very difficult sometimes. But you don't listen to them and you never take their advice, even if it's true. Okay. So a little bit about thinking you're crazy or letting other people know your gifts and them thinking you're crazy. It can be very difficult to 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 start out with the kundalini and I understand these difficulties and so don't buy in to somebody telling you you're crazy and certainly don't tell them about your phenomena you come to to a person like myself or Centara or or Rosemary Goliath or you join some of these communities online and they'll help you they will help you go to the communities that I mentioned that's about what I have to say about that, uh, Amelia. Thank you, Chris. And indeed, yeah, I know that at the start of my um, awakening, the phenomena was amazing, but I knew I was sane, and I think I actually survived by keeping the experience to myself, you know? Mm, so right. actually, we have a listener here, and I think Soul it's Connection. Soul yes, connection. Yeah, yeah, I put her yeah. through, or him. Yeah. Go ahead. Hello, Soul Connection. Hello. How are you today? Oh, my friend, I'm wonderful. How are you? Good, good. Thank you for calling in. What's your hey, question? Thank you for your show. Thank you for your show. Oh, hey, cool. um, so I want to explain this thing about, uh, you know, the, when I said all meditators know this, that was a figure of speech, and I was just trying to tweak the interest of you and other people. 
And, you know, I've well, been meditating. All, all uh, the meditators, like, you know, it's, it's a fairly absolutist way of saying something that is really not true. All meditators do not do correct. anything. Or they do not know, you know. You're right. You are, you are, you are correct. I just want to I want to explain uh, my understanding. All right, you you want sure. to go for it and try to, try to uh, let's hear you. Okay. Here we go. All right, and so um, so you're meditating, right? And you're you're looking at the inner ecosystem, and you mentioned about the about the senses. We think, for instance, most people think meditators don't think this way. Most people think like the eye is actually going out and seeing a tree externally outside of themselves, but what's happening is the light of the tree is coming into your eye and going into your brain, and you're seeing the tree inside yourself. Of course, right? Sure. See what I mean? Yep. That's what's happening. You're the tree. You're not seeing the tree outside of yourself. Everyone knows this who's actually looking at their inner ecosystem is that they're looking at the tree inside themselves. All, all, like even when you look at a star or the moon or, or uh, anything like, uh, you know, anything, the light is traveling from the star into your eye. It's going inside your brain, and well, you, you see, are see, looking see, at it inside now yourself. You, now is that true? It, though. You, now you that? said it. Now you said it. You're saying the light is traveling. And so that actually takes it outside of yourself because to travel from point A to point B indicates motion. And in the context of what you're saying, the light from the star or the light that is reflected from the tree travels from that source into your optic nerve and into the occipital area and begins to uh, image itself. But it is that. where, Where are you looking at the tree? You're looking at the tr- you're looking at the light is traveling from the tree right. to you, and so the light is outside of the inner ecosystem, as you like to state it. And so, oh, as as wait, where wait, are you viewing? Where are you viewing the tree? Where where exactly is your soul, your presence, viewing the tree? You're not outside at the tree. You're looking at the tree. You're inside in in the inner theater of yourself. Looking at how the tree. You know that? That's where you're. That's where you're looking at your how thoughts. Do you know your, how, how do you know that? Well, I know it because I, from first direct hand experience. So you, for your direct first hand experience, assume that the light is doing a certain thing and it's coming to you, and that you are present within a certain state that allows you to. To, to make this claim that everything is happening inside of you, right? Well, uh, no, no, I'm not saying everything's happening inside you. I said that you're viewing the entire universe inside yourself. I'm not saying, no, there is an external world, but well, all I'm saying is that you're viewing and interacting with the universe inside yourself. But there definitely is an external world that's millions and billions and trillions of light years away. You know, there's galaxies and everything but, that's... Well, what is light your point? Though? The, what is the your light, point? the light and sound is actually we're viewing everything inside ourselves. Of course, you know that's even science. That's, if even the optometrists know this stuff. It's like the normal yeah. optometrist. You go, you know, so, go it's to like. Almost, right? but I mean, it's almost, at, what? It's almost like you're stating the obvious. What What is your point be, be, behind that? Statement? Well, no, that that's that's the point. Is that we are looking at the universe inside ourselves? Because, like, even when. You know, here's what I real. You know, I have a telescope. Is, is, are, are you going so back I, to the whole? Are you going back to the whole oneness thing? Well, oneness. There, there's oneness, and also there is uh, singularity. And there's singularity, like there's individuality, and those they exist. Like oneness and uh, singularity, or uh, individuality, exist simultaneously. Because, okay. like, well, I, 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 won't, I'm I won't. I won't. No, 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 you don't have. Uh, you, you don't have to sell us on that. We've. We've discussed yeah. that plenty of times on this show. Yeah, Singular, time. Singularity and plurality exist at the same time. So yeah, yeah, they all they all exist together. With with regards to uh, your statement, uh, in a, from a Kundalini context, what is it okay. that you're saying? From a Kundalini, well, the Kundalini, I think, is a wonderful uh, idea, and I'm uh, I'm probably had more Kundalini experiences than anyone I know of. And uh, 
But I think there's you're, something you're calling uh, you're calling it an idea. I think there's something more fundamental than Kundalini. Okay. What, what, do you think is, what do you think is more fundamental? Well, that's that's what I'm saying is that uh, the whole universe is seen inside of ourselves, but actually, who is actually seeing the universe? What is that being? And what is the nature and the abilities of the being who's just seeing and interacting with the universe inside of Well, you itself? tell me. You tell me. This is, this is your well, theory. That, so that, you tell me. We, we, are, we are the being. We are this non-physical presence. And uh, we're this non-physical presence that is observing and interacting with the universe. And we have certain abilities and uh, knowledge about ourselves that is beyond kundalini and, be, and even beyond the whole physical universe. And so, uh, you know, that's who we are. That's, that's, the, that's the big thing. We're the non-physical presence. And our presence actually is, there's, a whole, there's a, like three foundations to this presence. There's an individual presence, like you're you and I'm me, but actually we're a collective presence too. For instance, uh, you know, the presence that is floating through you is part of the computer you're looking at has a presence, and the trees outside of you have a presence, and they're interacting with you right now. And they're becoming part of your presence. And then there's another presence. I call it the single, the, the the single grand presence of the whole universe. A lot of people call it God. And so we're like offsprings of this grand presence. We're just sitting here, uh, and we're a combination of all, all these uh, three levels of presences. But it's definitely, absolutely, it's non-physical. Absolutely, 100. percent Even the even the whole physical universe is actually non-physical. Once again, and, we're getting, it, uh, we're getting you know, into absolute. That's what we are. We're, we're non-physical okay. presences. Right. And even right. I, I worked for hospice for 30 years, and okay. uh, I've been through ca- to countless people who are passing away. And you'll notice sure. when they pass away that their presence leaves this physical world, and then it goes into another world. I even held two of my own children who passed away. I held them in my arms. and, I've, uh-huh. and I, But still, I'm, I'm connected with them now because their presence exists in another dimension. You know what I mean? Okay. And so All the right. presence is what we are. We're a non-physical presence, and we go from dimension to dimension and world to world and star to star so we can experience, you know, the universe and all this, uh, uh, you know, in like the earth. And uh, Okay. And well, like, well, we, there you go. we we have your your absolute opinion on this, and I there appreciate you your calling. I don't necessarily agree with it, but uh, I wanted to, to let you have your say. Thank you. Hey, thank thank you for letting for uh, allowing me to uh, be on your show, and I, I appreciate your your show. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. And I'll, I'm going to press the follow button in uh, ten seconds. Okay. 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 Bye bye. Bye bye. Okay. Well, there we have it. We we have a uh, a person that has their their own understanding of reality, and that is good. I certainly, you know, don't follow with it. Uh, uh, you know, there are some points, you know, I, I do feel that we, we have an energy that is within and without at the same time. And, you know, he has a certain name for it. And, and I, you know, for me, the Kundalini is as real as the shoes on your feet. Uh, anybody that has it activated and, and you know, I have to say, you know, millions and millions and millions of people are not typically wrong when they seek out the Kundalini. I mean, you know, there's a huge, huge level of historical reference for Kundalini. The Rishis had Kundalini. I mean, there's a very all, you know, it is multicultural. You know, the shamans, you know, they're not making a mistake, I don't think. And the the certainly the Rishis weren't, and the 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 uh, mystical Christians aren't, and the Sufis aren't, and the Bushmen of Africa aren't, and the Aborigines of Australia aren't, and the Native Americans aren't, and the you know the, <laughs> the Masons aren't, the Egyptians weren't. I mean, there's just too much uh, reference point for Kundalini as an actual force of divine upon the physical uh, understanding. Yes, yes, Amelia. And, Chris, I'm not. <laughs> I mean, I no, knew nothing not. about all these things that you just mentioned, the Rishis, none of that. I had no awareness or understanding or knowledge of any of that. And Kundalini for me was not an idea, nor did it spring from an idea that I had ever heard of. And therefore, my experience was my experience. And so I'm not wrong. It's retrospectively I learned 
of all these things. Therefore, right. where did that right. come from? One doesn't experience an idea, you know? So. But he's, he's certainly, I mean, you know, he's doing hospice work. He's doing really good work. And so I just want to honor him for his, for the understandings that he has and, and his right to express them. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think it's great. I think, uh, you know, I'm sorry that he lost his children, but once again, as as I have said in the past, you know, death is only, you know, one step out of this dimension into a next, another dimension. And so, you know, I, I'm, I'm grateful that he that he is passionate about his viewpoint and his position, mm. uh, his spiritual position. Uh, I don't see things as absolutist as he does, because uh, I, I do feel that there are many, many different paths up the mountain. But, you know, some people have to have an absolutist ideology in order to help them upon the path that they are on and I and I you know I honor his his uh, enthusiasm so so there we are uh, okay well there's there was a poster that I think you posted it Chris and actually it was a volcano and written up at the top of it was awakening is not an event in one's life story awakening is the falling away of the story itself um, yeah, right. will, will you comment right. on that? Sure, sure. Awakening is the falling away of the story itself. So, so read that again for me, please. It, it was awakening is not an event in one's uh, in one's life. Sorry, let me begin. Awakening is not an event in one's life story. Awakening is the falling away of the story itself. Okay, awakening oh. are the. Say, I'm sorry. Yes. Okay. No, I'm. Beg- yes, that was definitely the quote. I wrote it down. <laughs> so it's about the falling away of the story <laughs> itself. It's not. <laughs> not that it is an event <laughs> as such. In it would. <laughs> Please uh, elaborate. Uh, okay. Well, awakening, and actually, awakening you is, you had all you, know, you had think... already. Sorry. Go on. Okay, so Sorry. so here's the scenario with that is is that yeah here I'll just put you in the blue I'm gonna get that uh, feedback that, okay yeah stand by there we are okay it's kind of a I think that quote is talking about a kind of deconstruction of our life story our life story up to the point of awakening is is, a, is a, of a certain quality. We have five senses. We have five bodies of expressions. We we live our expressions. We we have the ego. It's a good quote, and I've seen it. It, it I put. I, it's a good quote. Um, this is an old quote that I had posted. I think on my page somewhere. I liked it. I I didn't really, but I liked it. And I and, and I intuitively feel it is absolutely. Not absolutely, but it is very, very true. And and so as the kundalini awakening comes into the individual body, it it begins a a falling away of the priorities and many different life expressions that have driven us to the point of the awakening. And so it is a falling away of the life story. It is the transformation, it is the change, it is it is the new replacing the old, and and uh, it's that's a very nice play on words, I think, and I really like it. I think it's a good one. It's a play on words. It is something, and I remember posting this. It was it was uh, it was just a play on words that I felt was very very important and very very effective with regards to the Kundalini. Uh, awakening. I mean, think about it. When you wake up from sleep, are you still in the dream? Well, you might be in some aspect of a dream. If we go back into the illusory uh, context of, of, of how we perceive life, but it's also directly related to the Kundalini. Now, let's look at. Let's take the the, the caterpillar and the butterfly scenario. As the caterpillar goes, you know, hatches and goes through its life of, of eating food and, and collecting its life experience, of avoiding predators and, and doing everything that it can do 
to do to to bring itself into the cocoon. Well, this is the life story. The cocoon is the transformative uh, position where the life story begins to fall away and the new reality begins to take its place. And that new reality uh, is is the, the ultimate aspect of the butterfly uh, hatching or, or taking itself out of the cocoon. And an interesting point with the butterfly is that you cannot help the butterfly out of the cocoon. The butterfly must struggle. And that struggling is what brings the force of the kundalini into its veins and allows those veins to fill with with that extraordinary fluid and allows that fluid to to stretch the butterfly's wings to its full expansion and allows it to fly. And so with that in mind, uh, the changing of the life story or the replacing of the life story is what kundalini is all about. It's all about, you know, struggling and allowing the, div- the, the, the divine within us to begin to express itself in the, in the external environment. Um, so that's kind of how I see that statement. I don't know if that okay. covers it. Ta- ta- it cover it? <laughs> yes, it does. It does. It does. Uh, you actually made a comment at the end, or at some stage as well, about um, we were um, we sit, we are sitting on our enlightenment like an ant on a volcano, which I really liked. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, anyway, uh, there was a lovely post from Magdalene de Deus. Um, and um, about digestive issues, you know, that she she was telling about um, her own sensitive digestive system and how um, she has a diet that is from Hildegard von Bingen, or Bingen, and okay. um, and that she has read books and that. And maybe you comment on that, Cousin, because I know that you also um, regard Hildegard very highly as a Kundalini awakening woman. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I will be absolute in that one. <laughs> uh, Magdalene de Deus is a Kundalini Awakened woman, uh, 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 and, and she has had digestive issues uh, with the transformation of the tension or the second chakra, second chakra uh, expanding into the perimeters of the first and the perimeters of the third. Um, stand by a moment here. Uh, Hildegard von Bingham, or Bingen, however you pronounce that, uh, was an awakened uh, nun in the 10th century Germany. And, you know, they didn't have TV, they didn't have radio, they didn't have Internet. They had a lot of time to study the herbs and the flowers and the and the animals of the environment around them and 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 she made the observation of, of certain forms of food that would be helpful to a person uh, that is struggling with uh, dietary issues and some of these issues extend right into Kundalini awakened people so, for instance, instead of eating uh, Monsanto-generated wheat, we eat spelt, you know, and, and uh, uh, she was very, very much a proponent of eating spelt in, in, to replace the other forms of wheat that were there at that time. And Monsanto wasn't there, but even at that time, she could see that spelt had better pro- properties than, than your normal wheat uh, grain, and, and so... Uh, they have uh, in France and in, and in Germany they have uh, get-togethers, gatherings where people make spelt hamburgers and spelt bread and spelt. Thing. Now the Kundalini will come into your digestive tract and will begin to change it, and it's that change that will begin to bring issues upon the digestive centers. And as as you begin your your Kundalini process, once again, you, uh, I will greatly advise you to to what the kundalini is telling you to eat. I won't say, you know, some teachers would say, oh, 
You can only have vegetables and fruit and nuts and grain and nothing else. You can't have meat because meat has to be killed. And if you kill meat, then you're not practicing ahimsa. And if you're not practicing ahimsa, well, then, you know, you're, 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 you know, you're going against the rules. And, and typically that's a rule against a, a, a belief system, which isn't really necessarily the rule of Kundalini. I, uh, in me and certainly in other people, has very, very strong dietary guidelines for that specific individual. Uh, Magdalene de Deus and her Kundalini have a very specific communication. And that communication to Magdalene was all about uh, the Hildegard food. And that, uh, you know, and so she buys the Hildegard food and she knows how to make the Hildegard bread and the Hildegard cake. And she know she is following those protocols and it is helping her. It is helping her with her digestive system. Whereas you, Amelia, uh, come back online, would you, and, and tell people about your dietary experiences and your gastrointestinal upsets. <laughs> it's a bit late. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, okay, um, are you referring to something specific? I mean, are, will I speak about the fact that I used to eat the meat fish. and that? The fish. Oh, the, the fish. fish. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, very briefly, I used to eat, I used to eat flesh, as I call it. And then the kundalini had me give that all up and I became a vegetarian. And I was a vegetarian and ate no flesh of any kind for two years. And then that evolved again and I stopped, I... Another two years, I didn't eat other products and other other things. And then one day, I got this um, urge or this notion or this thought that I should eat fish. And I was appalled because I had a really strong sense of, it, I, was, I couldn't even bear the thought of putting it in my mouth. But it kept coming, eat the fish, eat the fish. And at that stage, I knew this was kundalini, you know, um, and I resisted for a while. And then I knew that based on other experiences that I really had no choice, I had to eat the fish. And so I had a choice over what to eat. And I, and I remembered back to what I used to like. And I, and, I got, and I ordered for myself a seafood chowder. And even as it was being put in front of me with the pieces, you know, I can tell you I was willing to do it but I was not looking forward to it and the moment that I tasted it it was amazing it was exactly what the Kundalini wanted me to do I had it was blissful the flavor of it the taste of it I knew instantly it was what my body needed that the Kundalini wanted me to have that and for two more years I ate fish and I followed the direction of the Kundalini. And last July, again, bang, again, I was to stop eating fish. And so very much so, and I have lots of other examples too, but that is probably the most dramatic one. Um, well, and what, really about the gastro, the, what about the gastrointestinal issues, like a sore stomach or feeling the... Uh, the intestines move by themselves in a way that they're not, you're not used to feeling them move, you know, the peristalsis of the intestines. How about, you know, you'll have a lot of excess gas. You'll have a lot of different levels of change uh, in the intestinal system. Have you experienced those as well? Yes, I have. I experienced, I experienced things around the time when I was still eating meat, but I also experienced things... Um, you can act, you actually, I, I would have become aware of areas of my body that normally don't have sensation. So I would feel um, quite unwell sometimes, and I would have, um, I think, periostalsis, is that, the, is that the periostalsis? That's the word when you actually feel your intestine moving, isn't it? It's what, um, the, it's what the intestines use to move food along the intestine. Long, yeah, 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 yeah. I would have, ha I would be aware of that happening. Yes, Chrism. Um, and when when I would eat something that was not what the Kundalini wanted me to eat, I could feel extremely nauseous and unwell. Um, and I would also have other issues with regard to the excretion of such food, which would 
forcibly leave at a very quick rate. Yeah. Ah, ah. So, yeah. Well, the intestines, as I'm given to understand it, the intestines are like a huge electrical coil. And the, the, the coil is very powerful in the distribution of chi throughout the body. As the kundalini comes in to this electrical coil, it begins its upgrades, and the levels of energy and chi that the person experiences can be quite tremendous. It can actually sometimes give you an extreme cramp uh, in, the, in the abdominal areas. It can affect uh, the, the, the quality of the, of the fecal matter that, imp, that, that, that leaves it. Uh, you can have periods of very loose stool or periods of very, very hard stool. I mean, it'll be very, very different. And one of the things that I'm going to recommend a person take, if their kundalini agrees, is the kefir or the kefir uh, that, a, that a person can get uh, typically, at least in the USA, I know you can get it at Whole Foods. You can get it at a lot of different health food stores. Um, a lot of the time... Uh, you, it's helpful to have another billion or so uh, uh, in, in positive intestinal uh, life forms that help the digestion process as you go through the Kundalini awakening. And as, a, as Santara really uh, illustrated quite well, I think, it's very important for you to listen to what the Kundalini wants you to do. Uh, you start going against that, and you're starting to go against the transformation of the intestinal tract. And if you go against the transformation of the intestinal tract, uh, yes, yes, Suka, I mean, how, how do you pronounce kefir? K-E-F-I-R. You have it right, though, Suka. Yes, absolutely. Um, if you start to violate what the kundalini wants you to do with the intestinal tract, you're going to have... Uh, stronger cramping issues, you're going to have painful issues, you're going to have uh, uh, urinary tract issues, maybe some urinary tract blockages, perhaps uh, uh, some uh, uh, kidney stones or liver stones or gallstones. Uh, you know, it may go into the pancreas and it may begin to, to you know, disrupt some of the, the mat. Come on, Masha, there you go. The manifestations of the Isles of Langerhan and the and the and the uh, sugar levels. To the Kundalini as it begins to to change your diet, this is going to have a direct effect upon the levels of of activity and phenomena that you have in 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 your digestion area, and it's going to. It will, if you pay attention to it, yes, you may have some, some gaseous uh, changes. You may have some uh, dietary changes that are eminent. I mean, it's eminent. Uh, but you will have transformation in this area that is very positive, that is very helpful, that is very uh, painless. It's not going to hurt you as much. Uh, during the transformation process, there will be some areas that are not comfortable. And, and you know, we just need to, to move through those areas, accept the pain, accept the pain as a process of transformation, just like a, a two-year-old having teething pains. You know, we don't try to hide that pain from them. We can't. We, they, they must have that pain. And, and uh, we can comfort ourselves. We can, our spouse, our girlfriend, our family, our friends can comfort us as we have some of these intestinal areas. But uh, we don't typically get to move away from it. Don't take Pepto-Bismol. Don't take uh, Alka-Seltzer. Nothing, nothing is wrong that any of those things can, can cure. Actually, more things are going right with you than wrong with you. Even when you have intestinal uh, pains occur due to the Kundalini transformation. Okay. Uh, as Magdalene de Deus pointed out, a whole new level of dietary intake and and preparation can be given to you. A whole new level of dietary understanding. Uh, Magdalene de Deus, she lives in France. She, you know, she's French cooking. You know, lots of sauces, lots of of different things. You know, the the, the French are known for their for their culinary artistic ways. And you know, within the Kundalini context, though. So, 
she was given from her kundalini to explore, uh, um, you know, St. Hildegard von Bingham. And, and it's been a very, very positive experience for her. And, and even though I'm not, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna push you towards uh, Hildegard von Bingham. What I am gonna do is I'm going to, to give you that option. I think that's a good option. But the other options are what your kundalini wants you to do, what your kundalini is kind of pushing you to do. For Santara, it was to eat fish. That was a very positive thing. You know, and then, of course, two years later, it just turns that spigot right off and no more fish. Okay? So be aware of what it is you're putting into your body and be aware of what the kundalini wants you to put in your body and go with the changes. Don't try to fix them. You're not broken. In, in a way, you're being changed and transformed. The, the, you know, the, the, the caterpillar doesn't go to the to the Caterpillar MD saying, oh, my God, I don't want to go into this. I, I feel like the walls are closing in around me. <laughs> the Caterpillar doesn't do that. The Caterpillar doesn't try to change its evolution or the nature of its life. Neither should we. Uh, and I'd like to bring Santara back on. Thank you, Santara, for everything. And I want to bring... Uh, uh, Go ahead, and, and, and I'd like you to, to, to have a last comment here, Centara. Well, I was going to. How much time do we have? I had another quote I was going to ask you about. Well, we're not, we we're not, we're not going to do it. We're not going to do it. Okay, okay. Well, then, I would just like to say um, it was good to be here. Thank you, everybody. And I, I don't have anything else to say, really, Chris, and except I'll see everybody next week. And thank you okay. very much, Chris. Bye bye. You're, you're very welcome. You're very welcome. I'd like to bring Rosemary on. Hello, Rosemary. Hello, Chris. Uh, I thank you for seeing my light, however that goes. I uh, I was on late because I'm off time here since the we've had this glorious, wonderful seminar and your presence here with us and I'm trying to get my balance back in place so I'm off so I missed the first 40 minutes I think and I don't know did you tell people just a little bit in in gratitude yes. for our seminar yes, or yes. may I do that but I'm I'm giving you an opportunity right now but you have less than two minutes okay I just want to say we had an amazing time with Chrisom in the shock depot that he had given people as well was beyond our expectations as the way Kundalini is in our lives as well. We had um, 25 people, and we had um, just an amazing community, and we have a lot of expectation, a lot of looking forward to what's next for us here in the Twin Cities and the Upper Midwest. So we'll keep you posted on that, too, as well. And I know that we'll have some follow-up um, here with people, uh, uh, connecting with each other as community. I'm very excited about that. So well, I'm very excited you. about I was I was very happy to do that seminar there. The people in the Midwest are so nice, and in, in the Twin Cities specifically. What a glorious, beautiful gathering of people. And, Rosemary, I would like to thank you and Eileen Laurel. Yes. For doing for for putting this all together. So thank you both. I'm going to bring Eileen on so she can have her say. Eileen. Hello, Chris. Hi. I'll Eileen. echo what. Uh, are you, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I'll echo what Rosemary said. Uh, I want to thank you, and I want to thank everyone who attended. It was a, a wonderful time, and I was very happy that I could come and meet the people and. It, it was nice meeting some of the people from the groups. That was exciting, um, being putting a face to a name. And I'm also very excited about the continuity that uh, I think is going to be happening with Rosemary leading the way. So, and thank you, Rosemary. It was very nice working with you. And thank you, Eileen, for all the hard work that you put into this and allowing this to come and for gracing us with your presence as well. Thank you thank very you. much, and thank you, everybody. It's about We've got about 60 seconds left. Thank you, Amelia O'Connor. Thank you, John O'Connor, without which uh, this program would not exist 
Thank you, everyone, for listening, and we'll see you next week.